civilized when the white man discovered him in the 16th century, who presented his discoverers with articles of woven material made from cotton, which the Hopi cultivated. Are they the first Indians to weave? Some believe so. Contrary to the Navajo weavers, who were women, all weaving in Hopi land is done by the men. Being of a peaceful nature, they undoubtedly had leisure time and turned to artistic handicraft to absorb their energy. They have an elaborate clan system, which in turn carries many ceremonies. And as the men are called upon to furnish costumes, you might say, for these occasions, weaving is more than a commercial feature. This weaver is singing a Hopi ceremonial song. <laughs> While all may be familiar with the Indian blanket, few have seen a typical kachima sash. These woven sashes, when finished, are 10 inches wide and from four to six feet long and are worn by the Kachima dancers or used for decorative purposes in the home. The art of silversmithing with the Hopi is undoubtedly a borrowed one as they had no native metal with which to work in the earlier days. Nevertheless, they now produce jewelry of a very high standard. The hand pump drill, fashioned many years ago, is still used. This is a noticeable trait in the Indian. Until he finds something better to take its place, he never abandons the old tool. He still remains somewhat aloof to the machine age. A quick survey of the region where the Hopi lives would make you despair of finding much that is useful in this land of seeming waste. However, out of what appears to be common weeds, some of our finest baskets are made. The first step is the gathering of rabbit brush. The leaves are then stripped off, leaving a clean twig. Hard on your fingers? Just try it. In order to have color in the basket, our basket maker must resort to native dyes made from blossoms. This is not always possible, as the desert in one of her stingy moods must be scoured. Any yellow blossom will produce a yellow dye, and even the lowly goldenrod is courted and is suitably named sneezeweed by the Indian. Many attempts to dye twigs have brought about this skilled handling. A fire, a broken piece of pottery, and step by step, her future basket takes on a glorious hue. An improvised smokehouse is simply made and the ripening of the brush continues. The ever prepared Hopi lays away plenty of material against the winter days when the desert yields no basket stock.
At long last, the weaver is ready to start. Each mesa has its particular type of handicraft, and as those able fingers shape the basket, we see it is a type that is made on third mesa. The patience and serenity of her tribe is traceable in her face, while the stolidness of her tribe appears in her figure and manner. Her style of dress is certainly copied from the white civilization, but through tradition she still retains her tribal costume. On second mesa, an entirely different type of basket is made. They are known as the coil basket and resemble a plaque when they are finished. The credit for Hopi pottery really belongs to the Tua Indian. The Tuas came from the Rio Grande in the early 18th century to help the peaceful Hopi fight Apaches and Utes. When more harmonious relations were established, they settled on First Mesa and began the development of the potter's art which they had brought with them. The pottery is made of a fine native clay. The lumps are placed in water and left to soak, and then kneaded until the mass has the consistency of dough. Molding follows immediately, as the shaping must be finished before the drying sets in. If the mixing of the water and clay has not been properly done, all of this work will have to be repeated, for the vessel will crack as it dries. After a day's drying, the tedious task of polishing begins. With a piece of sandstone and then a pebble, she rubs and rubs. Now she is ready for the most interesting task, that of painting. She uses a black paint that was made by boiling down tansy mustard or aza. Then, with a brush made from yucca leaves, she begins. The design is laid upon the piece of pottery entirely by free hand. Imagine the concentration it requires to envision a pattern and retain it until it appears on the vessel. No mistakes can be made, for there is no way of erasing them. The process of firing is perhaps the most breathtaking step of all. Here she will entrust all of her work, and the outcome is beyond her control. The vessel may crack, smudge, and even weather conditions may affect the firing. Carefully she builds her fire, first with sheep dung, then with cedar bark laid on cedar slivers, and finally rock. The pottery is placed in the center and entirely covered with pieces of broken pottery. When the fire is lit, it will burn for four or five hours, creating an intense heat. After 24 hours, the uncovering takes place and reveals the fate of her work. They have an odd superstition that no one must speak above a whisper during the firing, or the spirit of the vessel will cause it to break. One is good and the other. According to superstition, someone not only spoke, but shouted. O follower of an ancient art who lives by the sun, and not the clock. Your patience will return, and on another day yield its reward to posterity.